Hi, my name is Tamara Mahoney, and this is the Open Energy Access web series. We have all the most recent episodes of Open Energy Access on the NXS YouTube page. And Open Energy Access is also published in a podcast, which is available in any podcast player. Open Energy Access is a show that I started to have a place to talk about open innovation projects, development ideas, and generally speaking, open principles within the energy access sector. So today I'm talking with Oscar, a power systems engineer with Okra. We're going to be talking about one of their most recent projects, the Cicada Wi-Fi. This is a communications module that provides internet access to remote communities. I think you will want to watch or to listen to this episode if you are um, a similar sort of company like Okra. Uh, they create technology that enables affordable and reliable access for anyone in the world. So if you are a similar sort of company, this is definitely going to be a conversation that you should listen to. Or if you're working um, in a mini grid company or an SHS company in a remote area, uh, you're definitely going to want to hear this. Or honestly, if you're just a communication technology enthusiast or an open source enthusiast, we, we really invite everyone to listen. Uh, before we get into the chat, I will do some introductions. So as I mentioned, my name is Tamara, and I work at the NXS Foundation. NXS funds open innovation in energy access, and we also promote and educate about open innovation. So the goal of NXS is to get more people in energy access adopting, contributing to, or using open innovation tools. NXS has funded the Cicada project. And Oscar was really the main point of contact for that. Um, you are what I would describe as the project leader. Uh, so with um, that introduction and my side of the story behind me, why don't I turn this over to you? Uh, Oscar, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, um, when you got started working in energy access and what you do with Okra? My name is Oscar Aitchison. I am a... Uh... Electrical engineer specializing in uh, energy access and in microgrids uh, specifically. That's uh, what I've kind of devoted the last five or so years of my life uh, to trying to solve the problem of, uh, of energy access. And eventually came across the co-founders of Okra, uh, Afi and Damo, who had this concept uh, that in its infancy was uh, it's not quite what it is today, the mesh grid, but uh, was based around this kind of fundamental idea of, okay, how can we make energy access happen faster and more affordably? And uh, it was based around the idea of, okay, this guy has a solar panel on his roof. It's not being used all of the time the capacity is not being fully utilized. How do we take some of that spare capacity and use it uh, in the neighbor's house? And that was the fundamental concept that got Okra started. Uh, so I've now been working with those guys uh, at Okra, designing the mesh grid um, and trying to improve that product to uh, today where we've deployed mesh grids with partners in um, I think five or six countries and uh, yeah, particularly in the Philippines, that's where we've got most of our uh, devices out there at the moment. Um, so yeah, really excited to talk about the next phase of uh, evolution for the mesh grid. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about what a mesh grid is? What makes it different than a mini grid or a micro grid? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's uh, that's definitely something that we need to do. Um, <laughs> so a mesh grid, you can think of it as uh, a network of interconnected solar home systems. So unlike a, a, a mini grid, a centralized mini grid, where there is a power plant in one central location, a whole lot of solar panels and batteries, and you're distributing that power uh, from one 
place all the way to every single house in the village. A mesh grid is decentralized. So each house typically has its own solar panel, its own battery and cables going in between them. And our device that we manufacture, the Okra Pod, is the kind of brains of the system. It's deciding, okay, this house, uh, this battery has all the power it needs. There's some spare uh, solar power available. I'm going to send it uh, onto the grid where somebody else can receive it. So, yeah, it's kind of this dynamic smart grid uh, that's uh, balancing supply and demand throughout the grid as, as needed. And really the benefit that we uh, bring by doing it this way is uh, bringing down a lot of the heavy distribution costs that come with a centralised mini-grid approach. Uh, so more than generally... Uh, quite a large percentage of the, the cost of a mini grid comes from the actual cable distribution poles and, and wires uh, mm -hmm. that are quite heavy infrastructure running uh, all throughout a village. So that makes them quite complex from an engineering perspective and it also makes them expensive. So we're trying to remove both the complexity and the cost okay. uh, by decentralising into what we call a mesh grid. So uh, Okra is sort of the, um, you guys are manufacturing. You're creating the technology that you then um, sell to the mini grid company or the SHS company in order for them to distribute the electricity. Am I right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. We're a, a technology <clears throat> company. We, uh, we build hardware, uh, we build software. And we, we package everything that you need to set up a mesh grid into a, into a kit. And we sell those kits to uh, customers around the world, Nigeria, Haiti, Cambodia, Philippines, uh, and others. Okay. Okay. So yeah. what we're going to talk about today, now that we kind of know a little bit more about what Okra does, although I, I bet a lot of people that would be watching are already familiar with, um, with your name. Um, we're going to be talking specifically about Cicada today. Um, and that's your name for this communication module. <laughs> so we're not talking about the insect. We're talking, which sounds so, at this point, it sounds so normal to me to be like, yeah, we're talking about cicada, et cetera, et cetera, without actually we saying. We should uh, <laughs> clarify that, yeah, we're not talking about literal cicada insects, yeah. No. Uh, so you guys have decided to name this communication module cicada. Can you tell we me why? Have that, uh, we kind of have that uh, tech startup Apple type uh <laughs> mindset of naming things uh, in what yeah. we hope is a memorable way rather than calling it the, uh, you know, IoT Wi-Fi communications module. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I like it. I mean, it, it does roll off the tongue a lot easier than yeah. everything else you just said. Um, so yeah, why the, uh, <laughs> the insect? I don't really know. Uh, well, why, so a lot of people ask us, you know, why, why okra? Exactly. Why not? We don't really have a f great story, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, it's a really easy word so, to say uh, in a lot of languages. So that, yeah, that is smart, yeah, actually. It has had that benefit. Yeah. yeah. So I think what a lot of people who may be watching or listening, um, they probably already know this, but it's kind of good to just sort of set the scene to remind people that, uh, you know, the types of modern off-grid energy solutions that exist today, uh, they rely on internet connectivity. This is just, again, to kind of try to set the scene <laughs> by asking you to tell me about what Cicada does, because I keep referring to it as a communication module. And I think um, we should kind of put that into plainer English. So what is Cicada? What does Cicada do? Sure. So uh, I'm going to try very hard to not use the words communication module. Thank you. Uh, I would love to have but... different words to say. <laughs> Uh, but it is really the device that uh, allows the uh, any – so we can talk about the Okra pod, which is the, the device that we manufacture. Uh, it needs to communicate with the outside world. Uh, it needs to send data on energy consumption, on solar panel production, battery state of charge, uh, customer billing information, you know, a whole suite of, 
pieces of information uh, that needs to send and receive. So how does it do that? Uh, well, you can communicate over uh, the cellular network, uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, or you can communicate uh, in some cases over satellite, which is what we're going to talk about, uh, or over Wi-Fi if there is a Wi-Fi uh, network locally in the community, um, which we'll also talk about. So the, the Cicada is really simply, it's the, the chip that uh, facilitates that communication. It uh, so talks it's a the... Yeah, it's a, a it's, chip. It's, it's, it's a, a chip talking with chip. some. Uh, yeah, there you go. No, but talking tell chip. me. So, so why why is it important to have this connectivity? So, if if you're setting up a mini grid in in a community or an SHS, you're, you're selling solar home systems to customers. Why does this company need to communicate information to where? Why? Again, I think a lot of our listeners or viewers probably know the answer to this question, so we don't have to go too deep into it. But I'm thinking about people, um, yeah, who are a little bit outside of our sector who are just mm -hmm. have that question. Why? Yeah. Uh, put simply, for uh, an operator to provide some kind of energy service or any kind of service, uh, to these really remote communities, they need to be able to see what's happening. And they ideally need to see that remotely because it is, we talk about the last mile, these places mm -hmm. can be incredibly difficult to, uh, and expensive to travel to. So it's really become a must in our sector to put as much of that information uh, on the cloud, on the internet, as possible. Uh, think about the the scale of the problem we're trying to solve, right? Hundreds of millions of people. Uh, it's in incredibly remote areas. It's just never going to happen if it relies on uh, a bunch of uh, traditional utility methods of employing heaps of staff in, in every location. Uh, it, we need to be smarter and... Uh, use what technology has to offer if we're going to solve the problem. I'm not sure if you were working with Okra when Cicada was first released. I think you were. When Cicada was first released, it was with 2G, 3G, 4G. And then there was kind of a break, and now it's being released anew with Wi-Fi capability. Can you tell me why it happened in this way and what is so special about adding Wi-Fi to it? I guess I could start by giving a little bit of background on why it was even necessary to uh, develop this uh, module in the first place. Um, for a company like ours, uh, we're trying to develop hardware. So by hardware, I mean uh, electronic PCBs um, that perform a specific function in the field. And to do that, uh, you want to start by using whatever is already available, right? If there are uh, off-the-shelf um, kits or boards that you can use that fulfill a specific purpose, um, then you want, you want to try and leverage that. So... We were doing that in the initial phases, uh, but uh, as in using off-the-shelf uh, 2G communications modules, and it really caused us uh, endless headaches because they weren't designed for what we were trying to do uh, in these you know, super remote areas. So they were just uh, not rugged enough. They were are failing all the time. We're having all sorts of uh, problems that were very difficult to diagnose. And that prompted the need for, okay, we need a, a better solution to be out there. And it, you know, we're going to put the effort into developing it. But other hardware companies that are in the same boat will also need access to this. So hence the first kind of collaboration with you guys within Access. Um, that enabled us to 
get the funding to actually develop an in-house 2G, 3G, 4G communication solution um, and then open source that so that other companies like us didn't have to go through the, the pain of using the kind of crappy off-the-shelf solution. Um, they could have access to all the design files and everything and understand the firmware and tweak it to their own needs, which is really important, right? Because um, if you're trying to debug something, you need to understand how it works. You need to have all the design, all the source code available to you. Um, so that was really the background between behind why Cicada. Um, then the next phase, which we're, we've just completed now, the Cicada Wi-Fi, it was uh, something that we had on the horizon for a little while, um, but has become increasingly important for us because we've run into these scenarios more and more where uh, 2G connectivity uh, is less prevalent and less reliable than we had thought, honestly. Uh, we're running into quite a lot of scenarios with our customers where there's either zero cellular connectivity at all in a site that they want to energize or they have to, that they've been given to energize, or there is some uh, 2G connectivity, but it's very, very weak or very, very uh, uh, spotty. So it's only available in this one location in the the community, right? So there was that twin need of, okay, we need a solution that's going to be able to cope with these low or no connectivity environments. And uh, Wi-Fi was what we decided to go with um, to solve that, that problem. And again, the same needs exist for other companies that are going, uh, going through a similar journey having access to all the design files and being able to adapt it to their own needs or it will just save them time and money. The fact that this project is open source is so important for energy access. I mean, by, by open source, we really mean the hardware, the firmware, everything is available on GitHub. I want to ask you about the, the pilot project and how it went and for you to describe the type of community this was listed in. But um, having made this uh, technology open source, have, you know, in just one minute or less, have you seen any downside to that? No, you know, we've, we've thought about it at various stages. Uh, you know, what if uh, competitors use this to kind of get a leg up on us mm -hmm. uh but which is yeah. a, i mean that's the kind of common concern right no yeah i mean i think the the openness that uh we have with uh other similar companies in the space is something that uh that i really like about our space you know we yeah have we kind of recognize that we're all trying to solve a really really hard problem mm -hmm. and uh we're doing it hopefully most of us for the the right reasons mm -hmm. uh and so that there's not uh I, I find that there's generally a lot more willingness to share information and uh, uh use that um, it kind of ethically, right? Like, yeah. not using information that you give that you're given uh, by somebody else to kind of uh, take advantage of them or whatever. So, no, I, mm -hmm. in short, I haven't seen any downside to to open sourcing this stuff. Okay, so to go back to the uh, to the scene where you're talking about, um, you know, making the cicada Wi-Fi, you. Uh, when you were coming out with this, you wanted to do a pilot, like to do the field testing to see how it would work. So you picked this village in the Philippines called May Buho, May Buho in the Philippines. And uh, you worked with a company who had kind of operations on the ground there called Ateco. 
so they had been, I read your case study and I, you had written that they had been operating um, with the okra mesh grid, I think already for a couple of years. Um, but they were doing that without any cell signal. Uh, so I'd like you, if you can, to kind of paint a picture of what that looked like. As is often the case with energy access projects, uh, you have to work with the the regulators and within local regulations, they don't always necessarily give you total freedom to choose the uh, the perfect site for your project, right? So. Uh, I'm sure that Ateco probably would have opted to choose um, sites that were easier to access and uh, more, uh, you know, had cellular connectivity for a start, but uh, that was not part of the the area that they were given, right? So uh, they had to provide a solution for this specific village, Mabuho, and uh, they did that with Okra Mesh Grids. Even though it is running offline, it still does function. You know, we built it in such a way that it uh, all of the core grid functions still work autonomously without any kind of signal. But what they were lacking is, A, the ability to do any kind of advanced uh, billing system. So... Uh, to track consumption and bill people based on their consumption uh, by in a prepaid way at least. Um, and the other thing that they were lacking was any kind of visibility on when things went wrong, right? So if uh, a battery was uh, degraded and wasn't uh, getting a full charge, or anything like that, that that wasn't something that they had any visibility on. So if there was a problem, they would have to physically send somebody uh, to go out and check it out. And that's a lot of time, a lot of money, and it's uh, very, very difficult, right? So that's, uh, it's, it's doable. And they would, they did it for a couple of years, but uh, yeah, it's it's difficult, and it's something that uh, operating an off-grid energy business is already difficult enough. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that's to, a nice that's a nice summary yeah. for for the start of this conversation. It's like, well, what is it like to work without any connectivity? It's like it's difficult enough. Let's solve yeah. the connectivity solution. Um, so. Yeah, it's and I and I also encourage anyone watching or listening. Um, you've you've really got to read uh, the case study that Oscar authored because, um, you know, you, you talk about just in order for like the the person working in the village like to have any communication with Ateco, it's like a hike up a mountain to get any kind of signal, and yeah, you can kind of feel yourself there, um, kind of like you have a simple problem to solve and it might take days just to communicate the simple problem yeah with a potential absolutely. super so yeah and this is the the case not just in mabuho but there are sure. uh, many many communities in the philippines and around the world but yeah. specifically the philippines has this uh, this issue of so many islands thousands and thousands of islands that make up the Philippines and uh, lots of fishing communities that live on those islands uh, that are, yeah, really quite isolated from any sort of infrastructure. There's still so many people left that uh, that don't have connectivity and they've been sort of deprioritized until now. Um, and you can see why, I guess. Right. Yeah, you know, if you have the ability to choose uh, to have your pick of sites, you're going to try and choose ones that are uh, going to be easier to operate. They're closer to uh, where, you know, a regional center or mainland or whatever. Um, they're, they're, but they may not, they may be very good candidates for uh, 
electrification otherwise, you know, it could be a, in the case of the Philippines, uh, there are a hell of a lot of large off-grid communities that are, that have a reasonably steady income from their fishing, um, that makes them quite good candidates, uh, from an economics point of view, as in they have the ability to pay for energy relatively consistently, you know, it is still off grid we're talking about. So of course, uh, they have a seasonal incomes just like everyone, but, uh, generally speaking, these, these, uh, Filipino fishing communities can be really, really good, uh, candidates for these, these off grid energy systems because they, they can pay for them. But, uh, yeah, if they lack any way to communicate, it makes operations really difficult. So why don't you get a bit technical for, for a moment um, and tell me, how does this work? How, what is the, the VSAT technology? How do you bring Wi-Fi into an unconnected community? VSAT uh, satellite internet is uh, something that has been around for quite a while actually uh it's it's not something that we invented but uh and it's not something that elon musk invented either with uh with starlink but it is basically the same principle with starlink uh, it's uh it's using satellites to uh set up a base station in a in a location and use that uh that signal to then uh set up uh, a network a communications network throughout the site so uh vsat is the way that we communicate with the outside world and wi-fi is the way that we take that signal and distribute it around the site uh which is what we did in in Mabuho. the costs are actually fully laid out uh in the case study that you mentioned um at least in the case of the Philippines, it it really is getting to the point where it's quite affordable. We're you know we're only talking about a few thousand dollars for uh, for the actual capex of the uh, satellite dish and all the various uh, communications equipment, routers, etc. Um, so no, it's not an expensive undertaking. The cool thing about this project being open, so and that's why when we were talking about the money before I mentioned like an access funded this you know, this project because it's open source. So because we hope this has this kind of ripple effect, um, it can help other companies scale more quickly. Um, you know, contributions, like there's so many uh, ways to to grow quicker, um, to get energy to communities quicker. And um, yeah, the fact that you guys laid out all the costs and everything is there in the, in the case study for people to read. And um, I, I kind of want to talk about um, about what happens in the community when um, when you did the field testing. So you went out, you you know you you, you tested it. It was successful. It worked. Um, and what sort of impact did you see when you were um, when when everyone was out there? And was it what you expected? Um, and when, I, when I'm asking about what it was you expected, I, I know that when you set up a project like this, you know, you kind of have, okay, like, here's my expectation. This is sort of my mark of success. So did you reach that? And did anything happen that was kind of um, unplanned? Uh, uh, there are always, uh, the answer <laughs> to that is always, yes. Uh, yeah. There's always unplanned things that happen. Um, but thankfully, uh, the implementation was smoother than expected and the devices performed better than expected so we thought we were going to have real trouble getting all of the pods in every single house to communicate with the uh the outdoor access points uh wi-fi access points that we set up around the the community uh but thankfully uh they performed very well and we actually feel like we kind of overdid it and we didn't need uh, as much uh, equipment as we bought, um, which was which was nice. So uh, I feel confident that there's room to optimize the costs and the design even further. So 
yeah, that uh, that part of it went smoothly. The impact, uh, the immediate impact to uh, Teco and their business uh, is that they're able to see these households on our software platform Harvest for the first time. Uh, so they're actually able to start getting some information uh, about their operations for the first time. How much energy are people consuming from these systems? Okay, can we uh, you know, start looking at things like appliance financing? Now we can do that because you know, that's a feature that, that we have that uh, allows you to kind of bundle appliance financing in with people's energy bills. So now they can look at that and go, okay, yeah, uh, this customer, uh, maybe we can offer them a freezer on finance and uh, have them have the payments be tracked on our platform. So that's really the, the short-term impact that uh, we were kind of going for with this implementation. But the perhaps more significant question that we were trying to answer uh, that we haven't yet answered, uh, it'll take another few months of of kind of monitoring to get there uh, is can Ateco comfortably cover the costs, the ongoing costs of the VSAT service by offering uh, internet as a service to these uh, to this community in addition to the energy service? Because if they can do that uh, efficiently and you know uh, consistently, then that makes the, biz the fundamental business case for installing the VSAT uh, viable. And it means they can replicate that to all of their sites. Uh, and they've got quite a number of these sites that, that don't have any connectivity. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it's a, a great thing for the communities themselves and for Teco scaling their impact. Um, so yeah, that's, We've kind of anecdotally heard that uh, mm. this is this is working out well, but uh, we'll need a little bit more time to really uh, say for sure. The Cicada Wi-Fi was kind of bought in to kind of be this, you know, to give these very obvious and very important benefits for the company, right? So to be able to monitor everything is fantastic. But now you're kind of mentioning there's also this idea that Wi-Fi could be offered as a service basically, you know, so that just people in the community would now have access to the internet. That's right. Yeah. Because you're, you're bringing this, uh, you're bringing an internet connection to the site. Uh, and that internet connection is only a very tiny fraction of the bandwidth that you're purchasing is actually being used for, uh, transmitting this IoT device data, you know, energy consumption and things like that. Uh, you know, it's in the order of megabytes per month, right? Um, so there's all this unused capacity. Uh, so if you can make use of that by uh, offering it to the community, you're giving the community a very valuable service and you're also bringing in another revenue stream uh, for your operations as a as a uh, energy a microgrid developer operator, and that's that's making the entire model uh, more economically viable and interesting. I know that uh, funders are increasingly starting to look at this uh, this like multi-service or multi-utility model uh, as a way forward, like to improve the unit economics of, of mini grids. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's this pilot for us has been uh, a way to kind of try and demonstrate that, yeah, you can actually offer these, uh, these multiple services and it uh, can not only uh, cover its own costs, but it can also provide all these additional benefits. I mean, you know, I, I never want to be too... Uh, too optimistic maybe is the wrong word, but uh, I, don't, I don't want to portray our impact as uh, yeah, much greater than it, than it is. Um, 
so I'm always cautious of saying, oh, you know, it's going to transform people's lives and, and things like that. Uh, but uh, I am uh, genuinely really uh, excited to see uh, the benefits that the community gets from having this access for the first time because all of the activities that are made so much more difficult uh, by a lack of telecommunications, uh, it's, it seems so obvious that there should be massive improvements in those areas. So uh, whether it's the ability to do business, you know, uh, you catch a bunch of fish, you, you need to call people up, buyers, etc. cetera, uh, you don't have to, you know, go climb a nearby mountain to do that anymore. Uh, you know, there are all these kids going to school um, who don't have the ability to, uh, you know, Google something or, uh, you know, access educational materials that now will have that. So, uh, yeah, these are all kind of more long-range impacts. And then uh, I think one of the most... Uh, potentially impactful things, in, in my opinion, is the ability for people to communicate uh, during a kind of a crisis or a disaster situation, right? So uh, there are a lot of uh, typhoon uh, strength storms in the Philippines every single year, uh, even if it's not actually a typhoon. Uh, like just a severe tropical storm, it's still, for these communities, really impactful to have some uh, some ability to communicate with the outside world because uh, past a certain point, the the Coast Guard basically says you're not allowed to uh, not allowed to have any uh, any boat travel because it's too dangerous, right? We'll have to come and rescue you, you know? So all these communities during these tropical storm events that happen like 20 times a year are completely cut off from the outside world. So, you know, imagine what happens. You're, you're on an island in the middle of a tropical storm. Something bad happens. You can't even, you know, leave your island. Call someone. Or, you, yeah, nobody's going to come and get you, right? Right. So no, it's the most basic. The most basic need, right, is just the ability to communicate with yeah. the outside world. It, it doesn't have to go much more than that before you can start to imagine all the other ways, everything that that means. But you're you're absolutely right. You know, just opening that up starts uh, starts everything. And I and I, mm. I understand where you're coming from in terms that you don't want to predict and you don't want to promise. I don't want to say but, that I'm the cause of, you know, or Ocker, right. or, you know, <laughs> we're doing all these things, but uh, I just think you're in putting general, the idea. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea is there, right? I'm, I'm sure that you, I don't think Ocker is the only company in the world that's working on this problem. No, absolutely um, not. I, but it is open sourced for anyone else to look at and for anyone else to do better if, if it didn't work out for one reason or another. Mm. Um, you've laid it out there so that if this didn't work out well, if the plan needed to be tweaked, um, everything is there. And that is already tremendously helpful. So, um, I mean, that's what an access is excited about. And again, I'm just speaking for myself here, but that's, that's why we all do this, right? Yeah. And I would so hope that... So I think it's okay to, to say it like that. Like, this is, this is the point. We're looking to... Um, to improve things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, w I would just encourage like uh, anybody who is currently doing microgrids or uh, yeah, deploying energy access solutions to just think about uh, is it also possible to offer these uh, these other services, be it internet or be it you know water or something like that. I know it's uh, it's an additional layer of complexity, but I guess my hope from the outcomes of this project is that we can show that it, it doesn't have to be that complex, you know? Um, and hopefully we've, we've helped uh, some other companies look at this and go, oh yeah, there, there's enough information here that I can, I can take to my decision makers and uh, and try mm -hmm. this out for myself. 
So what do you think is, is next for Cicada Wi-Fi? Where, where do you plan to go with it after um, you know, the successful pilot and everything? What, what do you see happening? Like I said earlier, I really want to uh, see the data come through on uh, willingness to pay for an internet service in the community consistently. And if that is uh, easily covering the costs, um, then that's the justification that uh, companies like Ateco need to, uh, to roll this out into many more communities uh, without any connectivity. So that, that's my, my hope of where we get to. Uh, from a technological standpoint, um, we're also looking into the future and trying to think about, uh, okay, we've kind of done this first pass at a, at a telecommunication solution that's not <clears throat> based on cellular, but uh, how can we improve it? How can we make it easier and simpler? So, you know, we're looking at um, different communications protocols. We're also looking at, you know, ways to extend the range to make it uh, easier so that there are fewer devices, <clears throat> fewer gateways, I suppose, um, required for a larger site. Um, so our aim is to keep innovating on that and trying it in our other markets that where, where we have customers so in Haiti, we've got uh, a customer who's looking at this right now uh, that's really exciting, uh, and we'd like to do the same in, in Nigeria because um, you know, similar needs, uh, not, not on islands this time, but still uh, plenty of zero connectivity areas that need a solution. So, um, yeah, that's where we'd like to get to is... Uh, proving this out in, in all of the markets where we have customers. Well, thank you um, so much for chatting with me about this today. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add, maybe where to find the information or how to get in contact or anything? Yeah, I guess we, we should mention that uh, if you're interested in using the uh, Wi-Fi Cicada uh, in your product prototype if you're developing a product that uh, you want to add wi-fi capability to um, obviously yet yeah, we already mentioned the design files are all on github but we also have uh, manufactured a a number of uh, boards physical boards uh, on a marketplace called uh, seed studio that uh they're facilitating the whole uh, shipping and everything. So uh, you're able to just go onto that website and click add to cart and have it shipped out to you. And you can have a Wi-Fi Cicada uh, proto you know, for you to prototype and play with uh, as, a, uh, as a development tool. So uh, yeah, I guess if you're interested in trying to use this, feel free to jump on there, buy a prototype, look at the design files and if you've got any questions reach out to our team and uh be happy to happy to answer any questions yeah that was a really uh, a really cool part of this project is being able to to order the board directly it's ready to go and um everything that you need to use um cicada is if you go to nxs.org uh okra cicada you're going to get to the GitHub, you're going to get to the Seed Studio, you're going to get to Okra's website, you're going to get to the case study. So it's kind of like everything you need to get started is on naccess.org. And of course, on Cicada's homepage, you have, I'm sorry, on Cicada's homepage, on Okra's homepage, <laughs> you have uh, you know everything you need to, to learn more and to get in contact with, um, with everyone at, at Okra who's... Uh, um, yeah, been a, fantac a fantastic partner to work with on this project. Uh, we love the way that you guys write your documentation, and I think that is uh, something that not enough people get <laughs> praise for. So thank you for doing excellent documentation and um, for, yeah, for, for bringing you know, Cicada out there and to open sourcing it and to being open to do that. And for just being so transparent with, um, you know, everything that you've been, tra been transparent with so far. 
So this is definitely uh, what we believe is going to help achieve universal energy access faster. So thanks for working with us. Yeah, no problem. Thanks to an access for the support. I think, uh, you know, you guys perform a really useful function uh, in the industry that's kind of hard to define. Um, but it's the it, it's kind of the catalyst for projects like this that otherwise wouldn't happen, right? You might have a lot of companies out there who are willing to open source stuff, um, but to get the buy-in and spend the time to, you know, like you said, put documentation around it and everything, uh, you, you kind of need some some extra support and some justification for that. So having the funding available from an access was uh, was great for us to to internally get the buy-in like okay yeah let's do this and let's open source it and i think that's uh that's a really useful function in the industry so yeah thank you yeah and i encourage every, you know anyone who's listening who's in energy access if you have an idea for a project that you're working on that you think um you know, for us, your project has to have value for more than just your company. So we want the project to be successful and we want you to like grow and have lots of success, you know, both professionally and maybe even, you know, make a profit on it, whatever. That That's great. But the idea is that uh, the projects that we fund have the potential for much bigger impact than that, that they could... Um, yeah, have this ripple effect. So if you're working on something um, like that in energy access uh, and you need funding, then head over to our website and see, go through our FAQs, check out our funding limits, and um, yeah, send in your application. We don't have deadlines, so we are open to receiving applications pretty much any time. If, if for some reason we can't, we wouldn't have the, the form up on our website. So if you see it, apply. <laughs> And uh, thanks again, Oscar. It was a really nice uh, conversation with you today. And we'll, uh, yeah, we'll let everyone know, you know, towards uh, the end of 2022, um, how things are looking uh, with Cicada yeah. Wi-Fi. And, uh, and we'll keep sharing. So thanks again. And thank you, everyone who's watching or listening. Um, subscribe, whether that's on YouTube or in your podcast player, and send it to a friend. All right. Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks, tomorrow for the chat. Really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll let you know how it's going in a few months. Okay. See you later. Bye-bye.